actually left Plymouth. I think from about 1864 to 1866, kind of in that ballpark, to work out in central Illinois at this academy. And these were not merely sort of predecessors of the POE, like you know, a summer music camp. They were more inclusive of, for instance, instrumental and vocal and general music instruction. And some of them arguably ultimately spun off into private music schools and conservatories, schools of music. So they're important in that respect. And I'll give you a particular example from Bloomington a little bit later, sort of explain this Gray and Skinner schools reference. Okay. Comprehensive organ methods were one of America's big contributions to our profession in this time. As I mentioned, Sundels was the first. You need to know about those of Eugene Thayer and George Elbridge Whiting. I am not going to go into detail about them. I'm sorry, they deserve the time. We do not have it, but please, if you are into doing online research, write down IMSLP and Petrucci Music Library, and you can see these things online for yourself. The, the site is a little bit slow on downloading, but you can examine these methods on your own. Thankfully, Sundel's Modern School for the Organ has been digitized by the University of Rochester, and you can go there to see more. But I've provided for you um, a copy of the table of contents in your handout and would ask you please to go there now. Okay. The Modern School for the Organ received in 1860, quite a nice sort of advertising review in Dwight's journal, which said, and I quote, no one who faithfully studies this work can fail to gain a respectable degree of skill in playing the grandest of instruments. So uh, the reviewer was endorsing this method. I want to bring up only a few kind of quirks about it here. First of all, I've provided for you a sense of how Zundel indicated fingering and pedaling. And to say, oddly enough, that he is inconsistent in when he provides these indications seems a little odd to me that um, it appears that the more complex the music gets, and you maybe could really use the help, the more reluctant he is to provide that kind of editing. But he gets the manuals and the pedals coordinated fairly early on. Um, he has a practice, as do you know, a number of people of, or dash out here in front, giving active pedal lines to places where then it's like you brace yourself with cords and you, you keep your body centered with that while you're doing the pedal maneuvers. And there's this exchange back and forth between the active pedal and manual parts. Um, he talks about legato playing, talks about staccato, doesn't show you how to do it, a difference from Sundel and later methods that are more specific. He also doesn't tell you about um, well, give actual registration indications. He just says, base things on dynamics, and oh, by the way, here is a whole section of my method to kind of talk to you about various tone colors and such. Okay. Now we're going to check your distance vision. <laughs> okay. But thankfully, you have your handout right in front of you. Take a look under part one. This was designed not only for organists, but for music committees who just might be planning to purchase an organ. Take a look at how he in, um, includes, uh, there's an outline for a, the plan of an organ of 10 sounding stops. So you know he's preparing people to purchase their own pipe organs. and. Further on down below, um, in part three, you get sort of the coaching on the various combinations of stops. And he talks about how for the anthology portion, he's, <coughs> go ahead if you would, Shelley, um, adapting to American organs, sort of works of the finest masters, including some of his own, and including many by his teacher, Rink. 
Um, but notice, if you will please, the names of Mendelssohn and Best and Hesse in particular. They will show up again. The method worked well. And in 1862, there was another, actually an advertisement for this that I'd like to kind of quote to you just a couple of excerpts. Okay. Um, the excellence of this work and its great utility are apparent. A slight examination even of its pages will convince anyone of its rare adaptation to the wants of beginners and also to advanced players. It embodies in plain language a great fund of practical information and it goes on to say this modern school must become the standard method of organ playing. So well received, well prepared, Thayer and Whiting followed in his footsteps and was quite successful. But Sundel's sort of coaching to us all comes not only from his methods, but as I mentioned before, from his periodical publications. And he talks, for instance, in his monthly choir and organ journal about what makes a good player and what makes a good organist? And ladies and gentlemen, they are different things. Let me clarify for you what he's thinking here. For Zundel, a good player is a skilled improviser, a ready reader, a dexterous performer, and an expert manager of organ stops. But a good organist is one displaying a religious disposition, sufficient taste to play published music for your voluntaries and so forth, rather than to improvise poorly, um, an insatiable curiosity about the instrument, and a sensitivity to worship practices. So I, when Sundel was saying you know, I, I pray with my fingers, he was serious about that. He really saw the role of the organist as being one in the service of the church. And yet he was known throughout Brooklyn and the greater New York area as a fine recitalist, especially good at peddling, and a very valuable colleague. Thank you. Um, we want to mention as well, though, his colleague Eugene Thayer. And again, this could be a source for an entire additional talk. But I bring up Thayer for his connections to Haupt in Berlin, for his work in Boston and later in New York. For the, if you want to take just a moment with your handout to compare Zundel's table of contents against this sketch from his uh, Thayer's Art of Organ Playing from 1870. Um, his work as the sort of editor of the Organist Journal and Review is probably his greatest legacy of all. And thankfully, the OHS Press has recently published this in a reprint. It's a fabulous source for just to dig into that and read about what was going on at the time and what were Thayer's takes on those developments. Zundel had to have known him. Thayer played recitals at Plymouth Church, so their careers had to have crossed over. Okay. At the same time that they were active, Zundel and Thayer and Whiting, in America, these English figures were producing significant organ methods, many of which either made their way across the Atlantic and took on you know, American characteristics, or were written in America themselves. I want to point out a couple. Have you heard of the John Stainer method? Yeah, well, <laughs> if you can believe this, in 1843, one Kenneth Hallett rewrote it for Hammond organ. And he changed the contents of the anthology. He starts in with a peddling, I think on like page 31 or whatever. But it's Stainer for the Hammond. Um, <laughs> Charles Edwin Clemens was English, but he settled in Cleveland. And his method received wide distribution and acknowledgment as well. So his is a name you need to see. 